Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me again today uh, for another episode of the Plant Free MD. And uh, today I have uh, another return guest, uh, Dr. Sean O'Mara. He had an excellent podcast together the other day look, talking about visceral fat and how this can seriously negatively, negatively affect your health and how actually curing it of your body can actually reverse a lot of these diseases. Dr. O'Mara, thank you so much for coming back on. Yeah, well, great to be with you, Dr. Chaffee. I really appreciate the opportunity to return and hopefully get uh, get some better uh, imagery that we were technically challenged yeah. by our, our first podcast. And and uh, I'll take responsibility for that, that uh, I, I'm not as technically versed um, as I am clinically. My, my passions clearly lie within the realm of uh, medical biology and science and, and not uh, uh, technical capabilities on on uh on screen sharing and, and camera rotation so i'm yeah. sorry again to the audience that that uh that we didn't get it right the first time but this is another opportunity to get together and, mm -hmm. and discuss the same content and go through those uh slides that weren't uh, we weren't able to share last time yeah well no it's great and you know i think i think that it, it would be great to come in and, and just sort of go through it again because you know even even seeing the same sort of thing again and hearing it again in uh, in a different format uh can really nail things home for people so i think that's very very beneficial and obviously we'll you know add add new things to that as well so i think that'll be pretty great and i appreciate your your time coming back on absolutely great great to be back perfect all right great well um i'll, I'll leave it to you uh take it away you can share your screen yeah. and you can get going yeah so let me Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. But for those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product, not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off which also applies to subscriptions giving you 25% off total all right thanks guys okay so great I uh, I am excited to be able to show these slides and uh, for the sake of the audience uh, I have uh, learned about an interesting uh, uh, tool using MRI to to track biomarkers inside the body and that the history behind this is that um, we purpose for a National Science Foundation grant to try to revert chronic disease. And uh, my research partner, uh, Dr. Zhang, who first introduced me to what I think is the most powerful biomarker right now that uh, I have found to improve and optimize the health of humans and, and eliminate chronic disease is visceral fat. And I learned about it back in 2013. And uh, Dr. Zhang um, at that time uh, actually invited me to be to have my own visceral fat scanned. And so um, we uh, started collaborating, working together, he invited me into his research practice. And uh, we, we worked together for seven years studying visceral fat and then uh, subsequently learned a number of other biomarkers uh, both inside the body and outside the body. So, for the sake of uh, you know the audience, I thought I'd, I'd make a quick introduction to how I got started on uh, utilizing MRIs to track this interesting biomarker. And uh, what we did, and what I continue to do today, now uh, outside of my research practice that we had to close because of COVID, um, I will scan um, clients who are interested in uh, working with me to optimize their health. Uh, their abdomens, and uh, I typically, you know, look at several areas within the abdomen, but what's interesting about visceral fat is it tends to be fairly symmetric at all levels. So um, regardless of the level you look at, you get a good indication of how much visceral fat is present. In other words, you don't get a disproportionate amount in a certain area, uh, and so it's fairly symmetric and, and so reliable. You can just uh, take a look at any particular area, but 
In this graphic, we show um, the transverse uh, uh, plane here and axial cuts through the abdomen. Um, and uh, it gives a representation in the image below of what an unaltered view of a MRI scan through the abdomen looks, at, looks like. And uh, the dark structures um, at the bottom of the picture um, are the uh, back muscles. And the white um, in the center of the image in the bottom is visceral fat. And the white <clears throat> around the sides uh, is subcutaneous fat. And the image above, we change the colors uh, to help people understand uh, more quickly and easily. Uh, visceral fat is the red in the center and subcutaneous fat is on the outside. Now, uh, what's important uh, for people to understand, appreciate, is that not all fat is the same. So increasingly, and I'm very grateful to hear uh, and see that this is happening, visceral fat is coming into vogue and you're hearing more and more about it. Um, because of its association and connection with, if not uh, causality, of chronic disease. So it has a, a very different characteristic. Uh, you know, I call it, you know, say it's bricks and clouds compared to subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat really, um, if uh, it's largely at least just benign, in most cases, um, you, you could probably, you certainly could have too much subcutaneous fat where it could be um, uh, really problematic and have too much. But th those individuals decide, I think, a certain amount of subcutaneous fat and exactly how much is, uh, is ideal is not really known at this point. I think we have to do studies, but it does, in fact, uh, appear to have um, benefit and a protective um, uh, characteristic for organisms that have it. So you certainly want some degree of subcutaneous fat, <clears throat> but uh, visceral fat you, you want to eliminate because of its uh, metabolically active state where it's secreting cytokines and inflammatory molecules. Uh, and for the sake of the lay person, bad stuff comes from visceral fat and its proximity to organs, you know, within the abdominal cavity, and, uh, and the circulatory cavity, um, the portal vein, uh, allows it to have uh, influence throughout the entire body. So visceral fat has this uh, amazing capacity for detrimentally influence, influencing the body of uh, the hosts uh, all over. So it, it doesn't just go after a few areas. Uh, it goes after what appears to be um, it, every cell in the body has some sort of uh, exposure and uh, vulnerability to the, the harmful nature of visceral fat. So that that being an introduction of visceral fat, let me uh, let me slide to another uh, example that I think is important to understand. So what I'd really like to share with the audience is um, Anthony the ability to um, understand what a good um, amount of visceral, you know, uh, abdominal scan looks like and what a bad abdominal scan looks like. So um, can you still see those images having rotate the next one? Does that show up? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Okay, so in the image in the top, you see um, is a abdominal MRI of a, a friend uh, from the Army National Guard, Gabe. Uh, Gabe has a, a, an enormous amount of muscles. So if you look at the dark structures, <clears throat> those are um, uh, uh, muscles are, show up as on an MRI as dark and fat shows up as white. So Gabe is predominantly uh, muscle um, and he has a uh, paucity or a very small amount of visceral fat, which is the white, some of the white streaks that you see um, kind of in the top, um, top middle portion of the abdomen. The ones that um, are kind of almost um, like lightning bolts or something, like slightly towards the bottom, the bottom maybe bottom half or bottom third, um, is is actually retroperitoneal fat and, and not not to, uh, not not metabolically uh, active. It's it's not visceral fat. It's it's outside the peritoneal lining, and the the dark structures, two kind of circular structures uh, to the left and right, kind of in the center area of that. Those are his psoas muscles. So I'd like to point those out because um, they're they're referred to as your core. So a lot of people do core workouts in the abdomen and, and now you, you can stop wondering what the heck your core is and what it looks like. You 
I've just shown up to you. There are those two dark structures. Um, and in Gabe's case, they're enormous. Gabe is a physically fit soldier officer and uh, um, works out uh, like a like a fiend. He is really and eats super healthy and his MRI depicts it. Now, contrasting that to the image below um, is another uh, friend who's got, uh, uh, that I met, um, um, who incidentally did a lot of, uh, he comes from uh, Bangladesh and wants to return to Bangladesh uh, to help out uh, poor children, where I know I know you spent some time in Bangladesh. So he unfortunately has acquired some disease since he came here to the United States. And uh, now Ostev has a huge amount of fat. So you can see uh, predominating in the image below is white. And it's because he has um, a large amount of subcutaneous fat, but even larger amount of visceral fat in the center part of the image. So <clears throat> Gabe contrasting to also Gabe in uh, image above, uh, Asif has a, a very small amount of muscle. So if you look at his muscles, um, they're very tiny um, and, and the, the dark structures are, are small. Some of the other darker structures in the, uh, what I would describe as an ocean of visceral fat inside of Asif are his, his colon and his uh, intestinal tract, so his GI system. Uh, but the, uh, the really dark structures are his muscles. So there is an unfortunate condition called uh, sarcopenic obesity, which is uh, the degradation and loss of muscle mass and performance um, combined with the accumulation of, a, of a, an obese state. And it's really an unfortunate state of humanity. And also is, is only 34 years old. To, so for, for somebody to be suffering um, sarcopenic obesity, at such a young age is really unfortunate, but uh, his MRI was sadly read as normal. So uh, it's really unfortunate that this degree of pathology and glaring uh, looming problem in his life is largely ignored by the medical profession because we're just not taught uh, visceral fat in medical school. No medical school includes it in their curriculum. And that's part of my passion is to try to influence you know, curriculum change in medical school so that we become aware, uh, teach doctors what is good and bad. So right now the audience uh, knowledge about visceral fat and reading MRIs uh, now exceeds virtually every single physician in not only the United States, but the world. So you now, if you just saw and listened to this podcast, watching this, have more knowledge than the average, than, than physicians uh, across the United States, Australia, and uh, and the world with with regard to visceral fat and what that looks like. So uh, congratulations. That's that's you know, slide number two showing you what is good and bad. And let's take a look at um, an important clinical insight: what gets you good and what gets you bad. So here is a series of um, six MRI scans that were taken over a course of uh, thirty five weeks. And uh, in the top left corner is scan number one at what we call week zero at the beginning of this, um, this series of scans. This was done, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in our quest to reverse chronic disease. So we were studying visceral fat as a marker, uh, biomarker uh, to help eliminate and eradicate chronic disease. So we were looking at a number of inter in interventions to influence uh, visceral fat and what causes it to increase and what causes it to decrease. And it, it was uh, both uh, fascinating and, uh, and, and a lot of fun to, to do those studies. And uh, this series points out, uh, I think very effectively, um, one thing that is a major contribution of visceral fat, and that is processed foods. So I will set this, this, uh, this scan up by saying, I think this, this slide uh, needs to be in every single health class across America and in grade schools, uh, junior high schools and high schools and colleges and every single physician's office to help patients um, uh, be enlightened to the contribution, the significant contribution processed foods plays within visceral fat. So between image one in the top left and image two, which is in the immediate right of it, um, is a period of two weeks. And you can see even though if the audience has never gone to medical school, that the visceral fat has been reduced in two weeks. And what happened to reduce that visceral fat is this 68-year-old gentleman who is a high net worth individual, very wealthy, 
um, just cut out processed foods from his diet. So he wasn't eating any processed foods. And he, he goes from the, the second image to the third, which is the top right corner, and slightly increased uh, because uh, he, he was so impressed with having lost all that visceral fat in such a short period of time that he thought he, um, he had this down really good and he could return to eating a little bit of processed foods. But he was very impressed with how much visceral fat, the, this, the amount of processed foods that he introduced, uh, between those two images caused him. And as a result, he became influenced by that enlightenment and seeing that in that uh, MRI scan, that third scan. And uh, he purposed to never eat any more processed foods. And uh, you can see in the subsequent, subsequent images from the bottom left corner across over the course of the remaining uh, 35 weeks that he eliminated the majority of his visceral fat and his abdomen um, actually took on a completely different shape. So um, the 68-year-old barrel-bellied um, uh, dad bod type of uh, physique that he had uh, in the top left corner is replaced with an oval shape, kind of resembling what Gabe had uh, as a good example of a healthy abdomen uh, there. And uh, he, uh, he has uh, reduced a lot of his visceral fat, but also if um, unfortunately I, I don't have the ability to do a pointer here, but um, in the top left image, if you look at the um, sides of his muscles, uh, kind of very close to the subcutaneous fat where the obliques are, you can see a little bit of a pink streak in the, the muscles. And that is uh, fatty infiltration of the muscles. The technical term for that anybody will look, look it up on Google is myosteatosis, myo, M-Y-O, steatosis, S-T-E-A-T-O-S-I-S. So this is, um, for the sake of uh, uh, those listening who don't have medical training, it's the equivalent of human marbling. So steak, uh, a steak you can buy, it has marbling in it that's evident um, on, on examination. We can see this marbling of muscles, human muscles on MRIs, and we'll get into some better examples of it down the road. But I'll sum up this slide by saying this powerfully illustrates uh, just how much improvement in visceral fat you will have if you simply cut out processed foods. And the second point I'll make about this is uh, that this amount of visceral fat was eliminated without any other intervention. So this guy only cut out processed foods. He did not exercise a single minute in 35 weeks. He refused exercise, and as a researcher, that bothered me because we were trying to investigate the role of, of uh, both exercise and uh, processed foods elimination. Uh, but uh, e even though it was imperfect science, it resulted in better science because his refusal and the noncompliance of this particular patient uh, in, in the study resulted in a really an important discovery of just how much uh, significance uh, uh, processed foods plays in visceral fat. So for the audience, the take-home point is uh, it, it is uh, incredibly important for you to eliminate processed foods. Uh, it really does cause uh, visceral fat and uh, eliminating it from your diet. Uh, we saw in 6,000 people that we studied uh, the resolution and elimination of visceral fat when processed foods was eliminated. But this this image was, is used, I shared a lot because it's the only example I have of somebody who did it without any other potential confounding factor uh, such as uh, exercise. So nothing else was responsible that we could identify uh, for the elimination of visceral fat in, these, in this person other than his elimination of processed foods from his diet. All right, in this image, I'll pick this up so we don't <clears throat> take too much time to go through this, but this is a, uh, a marathoner. And he uh, his image shows what we call a tophi. So he's thin on the outside, which is the yellow portion. There's not much subcutaneous fat, <clears throat> but he's fat on the inside, thin outside, fat inside. So all the red inside is visceral fat. And um, this is an individual who ran eight to 10 marathons a year, very competitive, thought he was very healthy, um, but would carb out and exercise. And he would, by all outward appearance, look like he was fit and trim. He was thin, but uh, inside he was harboring all this uh, inflammatory, dangerous visceral fat inside of him. 
Um, this was five years ago. I just bumped into him just uh, three days ago. Uh, he is no longer running. He gave up running, and he is only a sprinter now. So it's been five years. And to get somebody to turn on a dime to give up uh, distance running, a uh, serious marathon or 10, 10 marathons a year to become a sprinter, uh, takes some considerable degree and influence. And uh, it was his MRI scan that did that. So um, I'm sharing that for the sake of the audience that you you too can have a significant insights into your body and what's going on if you get this MRI scan. And for the benefit of any physicians or providers out there watching this, that that degree of influence is potentially available to your patients um, if they get an MRI scan. So I highly suggest MRI scanning to help patients draw insight and correct their lifestyle if they're filled with visceral fat. Now, on that point about sprinting, the distance running, um, this these two images nicely rep represent the change that happens uh, to somebody who goes from distance running to sprinting. So in this case, it's a 58-year-old <clears throat> uh, CEO of a company who on the image on the left has a lot of visceral fat and the image on the right, he's eliminated that visceral fat. And the only thing he did in this two months period of time was he stopped running um, 10 miles a day that he did every day, uh, five days a week, uh, and he simply sprinted. So he substituted in distance uh, sprinting for distance running. He no longer was dis he no longer was uh, doing any distance running, and sprinting became his uh, his methodology for uh, cardiovascular health. And uh, he didn't have any dietary changes, nothing, <clears throat> nothing else changed in his life. Uh, he simply um, stopped running and started sprinting. And he developed a six pack and his muscles became enlarged. Uh, so, so much so that the MRI tech came very excited back into my scanner and said, this guy's now jacked. And uh, I had to be concerned that he was taking steroids. And I, in fact, asked this 58 year old if he had started using performance enhancing drugs because this is back in 2017 and I yet wasn't uh, familiar you know I hadn't seen enough scans to see how much sprinting improves the musculature of a human being and eliminates visceral fat but we've seen this time and time again when sprinting is added into uh, individuals that it improves eliminating their visceral fat and gross muscle so it's now one of my uh planks and chief strategies for my clients that work with me um, to uh, opt biologically optimize is that um, I get them all sprinting and work uh, very hard to do so. So that's a good example. And the same thing would happen to you if you're listening and you're a distance runner. If you start sprinting, you'll eliminate your visceral fat better. There's something about, Anthony, visceral fat and sprinting that, it, or rather, um, uh, distance running, it, I don't think it causes visceral fat, but it appears to make it refractory um, to elimination. So uh, it just, it's more static. Uh, it sticks around the body more. And it may have something to do with the fact that uh, when you do distance running uh, evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily, uh, we would draw on our fat reserves to do uh, distance running. So um, when we eat, it just tends to maintain uh, that supply of visceral fat for the purpose of uh, helping serious runners. So I've yet to see a distance runner that didn't have a large amount of visceral fat inside of them. So I'm always open to the exception. I, I, uh, I didn't get a huge amount of distance runners, but those that I did and scanned had large amounts of visceral fat. And every sprinter I found had very little amounts of visceral fat. So we'll take a look at that example now. The image in the bottom left corner is a sprinter, and he, in fact, is an Olympic sprinter. So first of all, the audience should note that mostly he's dark. Uh, that is, all the dark structures are muscles that you can see. Uh, his gastrointestinal tract is between those two big circles in the middle and the two oblong uh, kind of egg-like shaped things on the top of his image with a, with a little crevice there, V-shaped, dark crevice. That's this belly button uh, on the top part of his abdomen. And uh, he's laying, yeah, <laughs> and he's laying on his on his back. So uh, if you look at his muscles, there's no white streaks in him. So he, he's just pure muscle. There's no fatty deposition within those muscles of marbling. 
uh, radiographically. Um, he, he's, his uh, image is singularly the, the most healthy admin I have ever seen in my medical career. Uh, you can follow this guy. He's an Olympic sprinter to this date, at Matadi, M-A-T-A-D-I, at Matadi, M-A-T-A-D-I, Instagram, shout out to him. So um, fantastic, uh, uh, eternally grateful for this guy coming in and getting scanned so that we could see this uh, enormously healthy individual. Now, we scanned through his legs at the same time, and what we noticed was um, he had very pure muscles in his legs. They're very... Uh, he had, although the image does not um, show it, he had very large legs. Um, they're just not proportion uh, compared to the image on the top, who's the guy at the top, his legs are actually smaller. And, uh, uh, and, and if you look, all the white streaks in the image at the top are, is human marble. So uh, for those listening, if you're wondering what your legs would look like, you probably would have human marbling in there if you've been consuming a diet of carbohydrates at any point in your life, uh, these uh, streaks tend to persist for some time. And so even people that are carnivore for a period of time still have these, albeit they are starting to grow wet, go away. Um, the deposition of uh, myosteatosis or fatty infiltrates within the muscles as a very slow and enduring process. So its resolution is equally slow. And so people are oftentimes disappointed at how hard it is to get out. Uh, but that, that cheap plank for that, again, is I get my clients eating carnivore and sprinting and actually I have them doing 47 things uh, to expedite the resolution of visceral fat. And that image in the top <clears throat> left of the abdomen shows enormous amount of visceral fat. <clears throat> and uh, the purpose of this scan is actually to compare the amount of visceral fat present in an abdominal scan with the amount of fat myosteatosis within a, a MRI scan of the legs. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, within the uh, images, you can see um, that fat um, is, uh, dangerous fat is pretty consistent throughout the body. And you can look for uh, fingerprints of disease if you look appropriately. Um, particularly in the connection of uh, fatty infiltrates of the leg muscles with uh, visceral fat in the abdomen. So <clears throat> I put that word normal up there because all these scans for red is normal. And so what I want to suggest to your audience, Anthony, and to you as well, <clears throat> that we need to change the discussion about training physicians and the curriculum in medical schools to not call these normal because the, this is like bricks and clouds. These two guys are completely different. Uh, one guy is on the verge of uh, potentially having a heart attack any moment because the amount of visceral fat uh, evident there is likely influenced his arteries to such an extent he's probably rife with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And the individual below uh, the sprinter uh, couldn't be further from that disease process and chronic disease in general. So um, it's a crime, in my opinion, that this isn't being taught in medical school and that these scans are being done all day long, millions of them around the globe, and nobody reads this, everybody reads them as normal instead of having a conversation with the guy at the top saying, dude, if you don't turn this around, uh, your quality of life is gonna continue to suck and you're gonna deteriorate the quality of your life um, uh, incrementally and uh, increasingly for the remainder of your life, which appears to be not long unless you turn things around. And then the conversation, the guy in the bottom says, help me to be more like you. Tell me how you live, because uh, this is how I want to look. Uh, pat the guy in the back, shake his hands and congratulate him. And uh, these images need to be taught in medical school. And they should be shown in, in health school, I think, health classes as well. So, so even on a fundamental level, uh, kids are exposed to what, uh, what health looks like inside the body. And uh, we have conversations where people get educated about these kind of things instead of keeping it within the realm, the esoteric realm of physicians who have to interpret this stuff. Um, it's not that hard. And I think the audience has got a good idea just in these short scans that we've gone through. All right, let's pick this up. This is the, this is the sprinter. This is how good he looks. Um, he developed all these muscles without lifting weights too, Anthony. He he didn't uh, lift weights at the time in this photograph and the scan. He wasn't lifting weights, didn't do push-ups and pull-ups. He was a one-trick pony 
He simply was a sprinter. So two points on this. Um, if you don't have a lot of visceral fat and you sprint, you put on muscle like crazy. It, you know, visceral fat it, it impairs your capacity for muscle gains and having, and I'll get into that in a few other slides, but um, the other other point is um, uh, he, he, because he wasn't lifting, it allows us to see the influence of uh, sprinting on the human body without the potential confounding effects of lifting weights and doing other things. So you would never get a build like this uh, simply doing distance running. And if you, the audience now, uh, reflect on what a uh, chronic, let me see, uh, a senior marathon or per person who does a lot of marathons um, would look like, say, after doing 30 years of marathons, they won't look like this. So um, I I try to throw some, some caution, uh, if not overt, uh, uh, warning about distance running because of, of its inclination to build uh, slow twitch muscles and uh, atrophy fast twitch muscles and uh, uh, resulting in sarcopenia. So I, for one, am a 60-year-old guy who ne who's completely eliminated distance running and I only sprint. All right, so the image at the top uh, uh, of those abdominal scans were so bad with a lot of visceral fat. Um, the image on the left there is uh, a picture of that belly at the time that MRI scan was done. So this is a client. Uh, he's got a typical dad bod, uh, 63 years old. And then five months later, he's uh, after doing the strategies that we developed uh, for the Vis uh, National Science Foundation to eliminate visceral fat, he, he lo lost a large portion of that dad bod. And in fact, he fathered a, a, a baby with his wife um, because his wife was younger and he was, um, they, they ended up having a, a, a baby, which was great. He increased his fertility that much. Um, now here's a couple of images of uh, steaks that cost me $56 to put this slide together. It cost me a lot of money. Uh, the steak on the left, I ate. The steak on the right, I threw away. Um, they're, uh, I think they're ribeyes and they show um, various degrees of uh, marbling. The steak on the left has no marbling because it's 100% uh, grass-fed, grass-finished, uh, and has a very you know minimal amount of myosteatosis or fatty infiltrates of the skeletal muscle there. The image on the right is fed a lot of carbohydrates, and although it's it's marketed as a tasty, wonderful, desirable steak, I would I would. Uh, I don't have my clients eating this kind of steak because it's, a, in my opinion, a diseased animal. Um, that's not a qualified opinion. I'm not a, a veterinarian, but I, I do have a veterinarian uh, client now who agrees with me that that is diseased in a cow. Um, and I, I've assured him that his <clears throat> disease within a human being is not restrained the fact that um, all physicians seemingly in America uh, don't understand that, or I should say the, the vast majority of them. But interesting, uh, Anthony, just in the past three weeks, four weeks, uh, artificial intelligence discovered that, and there's a study now on it, that this myosteatosis within human skeletal muscle doubles the mortality risk from cardiovascular disease. Mm. So you really, um, we really should be, um, and as a profession, warning people about the increased risk of these fatty infiltrates that are completely ignored. And my best friend is an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, I, I just was shocked to find out that orthopedic surgeons look at CT scans and MRIs that equally show the, these fatty infiltrates within the muscles, and they just ignore them. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it's linear, it's relationship to disease. So the more these fatty infiltrates the more disease subsequently people end up acquiring and uh, the fewer um, amount of fat uh, infiltrating the muscles, the, the less amount of disease you get. So MRI should be done, and in my opinion, routinely to look at skeletal muscle and visceral fat for the purposes of eradicating disease. All right, now in this image, um, we see the, the lung fields. Okay, so this is a chest in between the right and left lungs, which are those dark oblong structures um, is another mass um, and that's your heart. So your heart lies between your, your lungs. And then the, the white um, uh, area, kind of a, 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 
uh, clam shaped thing around the, uh, the, the heart there is fat surrounding the heart, cardial fat. So um, cardial fat is inflammatory fat like visceral fat. It has its influence, interestingly, uh, directly on the coronary arteries, which are on the outside of the heart. And where a coronary artery dives down into the heart muscle and therefore is not approximated up against uh, cardio fat, it's spared um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in that particular segment. So the rest of the artery will have some you know, amount of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, varying amounts, um, but uh, where it dives down in the muscle and doesn't have uh, uh, exposure to that chunk of fat around it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't have disease. So uh, we, in our, my practice, I work to, to eliminate visceral fat, fatty muscle, infiltrates, and fat, heart fat, cardio fat, and uh, all the strategies work together equally. Interesting. So uh, in this time period, it's just 13 weeks, and you see that streak of fat, uh, chunk of fat around the heart has been re re reversed in 13 weeks. And this is the 68-year-old guy they just cut out processed foods and wouldn't exercise one minute. So again, cutting out processed foods, what we saw time and time again in thousands of people uh, reduce this heart fat, um, visceral fat, and uh, it should be something that the audience, I hope, is now really getting a, an interest in these scans and why you want to cut out processed foods especially. Uh, now, this is my favorite scan of all. Uh, it shows arteries in the brain. So... Uh, d the dark areas are good where there's good blood flow. And uh, if you look at the circle um, in the image on the left where there's a circle, you'll see there's no darkness in there. And what it is, um, the MRI has the ability to differentiate blood from brain, brain parenchyma um, it, just because of its, its different density and magnetic fields are what are responsible for the image production here. But in that circle region, I circle circle it because of the absence of blood flow there. So that is an atherosclerotic cardiovascular plaque. So a large amount of disease in that particular segment of that particular artery, which is the middle cerebral artery on the right there, is a big plaque. And uh, if you look on the, the MCA, the middle cerebral artery on the left side, um, it gets kind of hazy towards the, the distal portion of the further out part of that artery. And that's because there's another plaque there that's kind of obstructing the blood, but not as much as it is in the circled region. Now, in the image on the right, uh, where I've circled again, it's been restored. And the take-home point is, one, this restoration is possible using the same principles that we developed for the National Science Foundation, uh, which I've also pinned in my Instagram account. Uh, if you go to my Instagram page, pinned to the top are these strategies. And uh, uh, it, it doing them opened up this, this lesion in, uh, in just nine months. So uh, what's really interesting is that uh, we, we just aren't, aren't taught this in medical school. I mean, we, we are taught that to open up these lesions, you got to stent or do angioplasty. And you as a neurosurgeon know the risk of trying to stent and angioplasty do an angioplasty and, and the circle was of middle cerebral artery is, is fraught with a lot of complication because that would require you to jump in a real hurry to try to go through it. And that would be a real mess to try to access all that. So we don't even stent and balloon open these things. We just, the physicians who treat these, just give them statins. And as your audience might wonder uh, how effective that is, it's not. It, it does not open up these lesions. Um, at all. But if you simply live right and appropriately, like eat meat, uh, eat uh, some uh, fermented foods and, and, uh, and exercise intensely like sprinting and cold showers and saunas and the like and the other things I have pinned in my Instagram account, you can up that, open up those kind of lesions. But it doesn't just open up one single lesion. Those strategies improve your entire body. So lesions all over your body to include your capillary bed. So if you've got a big plaque like that in your artery, you're going to have those kind of lesions in your capillaries where all the magic happens, how your, your cells are fed and get oxygenated. Um, all that occurs at, a, at the level of capillaries and you'll have disease there. So um, it is not an improvement. It's not in isolation. That's tends to be how we operate in conventional healthcare. We go after one particular thing and treat it. 
But when it comes to changing your life, you change your body. So as you change your lifestyle, you improve your entire, all your cells, all your tissues. And so uh, what we would routinely see in these people is as, as their arterial system opens up from eliminating atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, is the arteries start um, behaving more in a healthy manner. And we saw the onset of a very interesting manifestation that I call arter visible pulses. So your pulses become visible. So you don't take a pulse by feeling it, you just look at it. You can see it you know, visibly pulsating in front of you. And the degree to which it is uh, uh, visibly apparent and how much it's, it's, it's pulsating in front of you, the magnitude of it is, uh, in direct proportion to how healthy you are. So a very small uh, pulsing uh, artery means some improvement, some level of health, but a massive flash of improvement of the, of the artery suggests uh, a, a, opt, a more optimal state of arterial um, health and uh, perfusion. So when that blood flow improves, look at the the enormous change that happens to the tissue. So the image on the left is my face. Uh, as I appeared at the age of 48, um, I weighed 165 pounds and I was filled with visceral fat. I don't have a scan to show it at that time, but that's how bad I look. I look like the average American, but then look at the image on the right, which shows the elimination of visceral fat and the dramatic impact that that had on my face and it's really all over my body, but I just have a, that picture in my face. And uh, that is me 10 years later. And I actually weigh more uh, in that image um, on the right. So a lot of people think, well, I was just maybe a fat guy on the, on the left. But no, uh, the truth is uh, I was a diseased guy with a lot of visceral fat. And that's what happens when you improve blood flow. You would change your appearance all over your body. And I like to say that our faces um, express our health. So we, we, uh, how, we reveal how healthy we are by the appearance of our face. So if you're seeing this and you're kind of shocked at those differences of those photos, I would suggest that you break out your old photographs and start looking at how you looked 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago and see um, how your image has changed uh, during that time. And one other interesting one, that I'll talk about will be uh, uh, noses, but um, another uh, image is this uh, abdomen, how it's sticking out. I wanna explain uh, what, what goes on there and how visceral fat has a role uh, in that. So uh, this guy is a typical American dad bod that sticks out like this and people are becoming increasingly used to and sadly tolerant of, and even worse, some people are oddly attracted to that uh, and, and uh, I have interesting theories why that might be the case, but this is a friend of mine who's got a bit of a dad bod. Um, he deployed with me to, uh, to the Middle East and the army, and uh, he's got a protuberant abdomen that is an impending dad bod, I'd like to say, and that, that might be your case if you're looking today. But let's take a look at these images here that are of me that I accidentally took the one, um, uh, me standing up on the left, uh, and it's not attractive. If you're looking at that, you, some of you might be saying, oh God, I hope I never look like that. And you would be correct in saying that because that is not a healthy look. Um, my abdomen is protruding there. If you look in that image with the shorter pants um, sticking out um, anteriorly and uh, forward, a small dad bod uh, developing there. But if you look at my frame, my skeleton, um, I look like the graphic to the left, you know, with a kind of funny S-shaped uh, spine. You see these people walking around a lot. Usually they're older um, and almost always when they do have that kind of figure, they'll have a tummy on them, a protruding belly sticking out, um, evidencing visceral fat. The influence, I would like to say more correctly, the influence of visceral fat uh, on, their on their tissues and it causes that gradual decline and atrophy of the muscles, uh, and particularly the erecting spiny muscles to help you erect, stay erect. And so as I eliminated my visceral fat, look at my image on the right. And largely what happened here is I went carnivore. So between the two images, 
um, a predominant, but the predominant change responsible there is I went carnivore, reducing my visceral fat even more. But my uh, my visceral fat actually in the image on the left was already really uh, low. Uh, I don't I don't have that particular scan available, but um, I don't really have any visceral fat in that image. I just have the influence of visceral fat. So visceral fat degrades muscles, causes the muscles and the fascia, ligaments, uh, everything to weaken. And so I just can't hold my guts in anymore. So if you got a dad bod uh, where your, your, your belly is sticking out like that, it's because the muscles in your abdomen are so weak, they can't hold your guts in anymore. So if I take a 17 year old, I have a 17 year old son, and I take the, all the amount of visceral fat that this guy has in, in his abdomen, put in my 17-year-old son's abdomen, his abdomen will be nice and straight, flat. It's, it's the exposure over time to those inflammatory molecules that this guy has carried around in the form of visceral fat for a long time that's degraded those muscles and his fascia and allows that belly to stick out. So if you're listening today and you have a flat abdomen, you, um, it's because you haven't yet succumbed to the influence of visceral fat. But if you're young and you're eating carbohydrates and processed foods um, and you are maybe stressed out, you're drinking alcohol, you're not sleeping, uh, you're doing distance exercise, then you run the risk of getting an abdomen like this. And this, isn't, this shouldn't be called the the, the dad bod should be called the weak bod because this guy's weak all over um, from the influence of visceral fat. And Alex here is starting to get some weakness with his belly. And Sean had some weaknesses, his belly. And then look, Sean corrected um, by uh, getting rid of my visceral fat and then doing these strategies allowed the improvement. So my, my, uh, my, my uh, posture is improved. I stand up straight. The shape of my head improved. The appearance, I became, uh, my, look at the veins on my hands from the vascular changes, improvement in my vascularity uh, from um, the, those strategies and visceral fats, lack of influence, uh, has this systemic improvement over the entire body. So as my face improves, so did my, my body. So here's, here's a very interesting point. Now look at this, uh, these faces. Um, we talked about this uh, last time, Anthony. Um, these three faces, fascinating photograph. The time period, if you're looking at it for the first time and you don't know, I, I want you to think about how long is the time period between these two photographs. And most people guess somewhere between um, three months and uh, six months to, to change the face that much. But the truth is uh, the time difference between these photographs is only three days. And so what happened is this is a 40 year old uh, client of mine named Daniel uh, who, um, who fasted, went on an extended fast for the first time in his, in his life, 72 hours. So he had this significant change in his face. So um, I had to ask as a researcher, how could he add that much change to his face in just three days? If you took a 60 year old average male or female, and fasted them a week uh, or even two weeks, they wouldn't have this much change in their face. And the reason is, in my opinion, we need to do studies more on that, is the absence of visceral fat uh, and this uh, uh, fasting exercise allowed Daniel to get this profound benefit. So visceral fat acts as a governor, an impedance, um, uh, obstructing the beneficial stimulus that happens to a human body that we get exposed to through a hormesis. So some kind of a stressful uh, stimulus like lifting weights um, is a hormetic stimulus that it damages uh, an organism from which the, the organism responds with recovery and uh, improvement through hypertrophy. So damage, uh, Daniel damaged his body by fasting um, he recovered and he had this improvement and it happened in just a uh, three days period of time because Daniel didn't have as much visceral fat. So the take home point is if you don't have as much visceral fat, you get much more benefit when you get exposed to hormetic stimulus, hormetic responses. So 
cold showers, uh, saunas, uh, fasting, exercising, sprinting, lifting weights, that all gives you more benefit if you have less visceral fat. Now, those same things, that doesn't mean, well, I'm not going to get any benefit if I know those those hermetic practices all work to get rid of that visceral fat. So what I tell my clients, and we've noticed this time and time again, their best results happen um, down the road as that visceral fat goes. They get a lot more demonstrable change in them than what they get initially. My, client, my, my clients are ecstatic working with me. You know, their first month, they, they're jumping up and down how much benefit they have. But, you know, the real change happens years down the road. So um, here's an example of that. So uh, the, fountain, uh, the fountain of health really is just understanding that the, the health of the organis organism defines uh, the benefit in, in exercise and everything you get exposed to. So we've long known this particular um, uh, strategy for putting on muscle in the bodybuilding uh, community that it's stimulus affecting the organism causing the response which is hypertrophy muscle uh, but what is not paid attention and not well known within the weightlifting community and the physician community is the health of the organism defines the level of response so here's the interesting thing you take a uh, a, a 60 year old guy and you um, you, you have them do the same workout as my 17 year old son. And you do that for six months, exact same weights, exact same sets, exact same uh, repetitions. Uh, uh, the six year old guy will hardly put on any muscle, if at all. My 17 year old son will put a lot on. And that's because my 17 year old son is not younger. He's healthier. He has less visceral fat. The six year old guy is going to have a lot of visceral fat, uh, most likely, unless there's somebody like me. So there I am, age 56, and there I am today, age 59. Um, that, that was about six, four months ago or so I took that photograph. Um, but you can see the, the muscle growth that I've had. And uh, now I will share, I don't have photographs of it, but I'm gonna, this will be the first podcast uh, that I will talk about this, um, this interesting point. And, uh, and that is a new biomarker that I've just really, uh, identified and called just just in the past week, and I shared with you, Anthony. You were one of the first doctors I called up and shared this with, and I call it the post-workout muscle pump. Now, truth be told, the image on the right is um, after a workout. Um, so, um, it it uh, in young guys they get this big muscle pump, but if you're 60 and 70 years old. Um, and you you go and work out. You just don't get a post muscle um, post workout muscle pump like you did when you're in your twenties. And if you're really honest, and you're you're some kind of a gym rat, and you're fifty years old, and you're a crossfitter, and you think you're really tough, you, if you're really honest to yourself, you don't get the same degree of muscle pump that you did when you're eighteen. You just can't remember because that was thirty two freaking years ago. So how do you know? Here's what I'm going to tell you: take photographs. I want you, if you're listening today, when you work out, take a photograph of your body before you work out, take a photograph of your body after you've busted your butt working out and follow how much your muscles have grown. That's your post-workout muscle pump. And I think that's an important biometric because here's what I'll submit. I believe, and I'd like to see studies, of course, to, to verify this, that the degree to which you get a muscle workout is the degree to which you're healthy and the degree to which you can put on muscle and uh, optimize your response to the stimulus you get exposed to. So I would suggest to the listening audience that the post-workout muscle pump that, I'm, that I call here is a far better, more important biomarker along with visceral fat that people should be following rather than cholesterol and all, I'm just going to come out and call it nonsense that the conventional healthcare system is misleading people. And I, yeah, I use hyperbole with regard to cholesterol. I do look at it a little bit, but the truth is we'd be far better off if we never mentioned the word cholesterol and we simply talked about visceral fat, fatty infiltrates in the muscles, uh, your muscle pump after your workout, 
These things will be far better guides of our health and tools for evaluating human health than looking at some numeric representation uh, in, a, in a lipid panel uh, of which changes all the time, is, is incredibly dynamic, and every doctor has a different opinion about. So um, I, think, uh, I think there's just too much discussion about importance attached to cholesterol, and it's distracting us from better things that we should be looking at. Um, and feel free, Anthony, if you have any if you have any questions, jump in here anytime. Feel yeah, like no, it's just, no, 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 it's great. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> so th this is an image of another client um, uh, who came to me, and his image is on the left, and he's got a dad bod, and uh, uh, his belly is sticking out. And this is him three months later, how much he changed um, doing the uh, strategies that, that I developed for the National Science Foundation. And and then I've added to uh, numerous, numerous times since then, uh, a, a, a considerable reduction. So um, both Daniel, uh, Daniel is a IT guy, uh, really smart as heck, 40 year old. And uh, he's, he's fascinated by the photographs too. So Daniel is, has joined, uh, Daniel and other clients have come to me and we're, we're now forming a company, we're a startup. So I'm no longer a a doctor practice. We're a startup. We're a cool, really cool startup. And we're looking to do what Sean O'Meara has been trying to do in his medical, in his medical practice, which is optimize humans. Uh, we want to form a, a business entity that uh, purposes to commercialize the optimization of humans for the purposes of propagating across the country. I say commercialize it because it's going nowhere if it's a charity, uh, if it's a nonprofit, uh, the wheels of commerce, uh, are driven by profit. And uh, so if we want this to get quickly uh, out into available realms, uh, we're going to do it at, in, in, as a business. So the startup is, is purposing to do that. And both Alvaro and Daniel are involved in that. And uh, they both want to be involved because they had such great results. And, uh, and, and these photographs show that. So here's uh, Alvaro's um, um, uh, MRI scan. So you can see his visceral fat in the image in the bottom left corner is considerable. He is more visceral fat than he is anything else. And then you can see um, in the last image on the, the right, uh, he substantially reduced his visceral fat. And the time period, again, is just three months. And commensurate with this reduction of that dad bod is the reduction in that visceral fat. And the images on the top are his heart images showing cardio fat or heart fat and how much his heart fat also uh, significantly reduced during that period of time. So these images, I hope your audience is tracking how important they are for the purposes of helping to assist um, humans and, and patients, uh, uh, individuals uh, eliminate what is a real threat in their health and what to track rather than silly cholesterol. And uh, I like to, to ask the question too of people, who's ever had an experience with a single person in their life that got control or improved their cholesterol and it and changed their whole life. It just doesn't happen. I mean, we do not have testimonies. We got another person who's lowered their cholesterol and look how great they are. Look how great look, they're talking, talking like crazy, how much they improved their life. Nonsense. Why are we talking about it? You know, uh, but these things talk to people that eliminate visceral fat. Now that is life changing. And so Alvaro's picture there shows how much he's changed his face. And that wasn't even three months. Um, and then here are my faces. The top image on the left is me, 30 years old, <clears throat> nice dark hair. And then the image in the, in the middle top is me, 40, 48, the image before. And then after that image, 48, where I'm um, in the top right, I learn about visceral fat. And I start eliminating it. So you can see the shape of my face. This is what happens. So I want to make this point about these images here. Uh, you heard the expression, you need to get, uh, get in shape. Well, you need to get your face in shape. Um, and what happens when you get your face in shape, your body gets in shape at the same time. And so you can see the shape of my face goes from what I described in the top right corner as the quintessential inflamed look, you know, quint quintessentially inflamed face uh, to the image in the bottom left being less inflamed, it's more leaner. Um, and then the image in the middle um, 
of the bottom row shows even uh, a, a better shape, a, a leaner face. And then finally, a, a recent image of me today with a, a more, even still more lean face. So um, if your audience is listening today and they're looking at their photographs, what they should be looking at for is inflammation, a puffy, inflamed um, uh, face where you lose your definition. And you can just walk around shopping malls and churches and public congregation areas and see this look in people's faces where they just are inflamed. And uh, certain individuals uh, rarely, on occasion, you'll see them. Um, and typically, who's got these uh, in shape, you know, lean faces? 16, 17 year old girls and guys, you know, 18 year old guys that are lean, um, haven't yet accumulated a lot of visceral fat, don't have a disruptive microbiome. And so the shape of their faces are, are leaner. So <clears throat> my face in the bottom right corner will never be mistaken as a 16 year old, but the shape of my face is closer to uh, a teenager or a 20 year old. Um, and uh, it's uh, blind, that is all my gray hair, and my, my organ, the largest organ in your body, your skin. Um, I show evidence of uh, being older, but I at least uh, get rid of the, the chronic disease of uh, visceral fat accumulation. And so I have a leaner face. So get out your old photographs. That's way better than following your cholesterol. Uh, see what's going on. And if, in most cases, your face has gotten worse um, as you aged. And the evidence of that is LinkedIn profile, your social media profile. If you got Instagram or Yahoo or YouTube or whatever, and you got your face up there or on LinkedIn, if you're a business uh, woman or guy, then you tend to use your photographs from the, 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 uh, the long past. Well, you think I'm gonna use my, photo, my old photographs? No way. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you like to be somebody, if you're listening today, to be able to say, I want my most current photograph in there because I look better. And the way you'll look better is you start living better. So quit fooling around. You're eating processed foods. That is super bad stuff. It causes super bad stuff inside your visceral fat. It screws up your face. It screws up your body. It screws up your arteries. And it's really responsible for everything going wrong in your body. And I you know, stand for the proposition, trying to bring awareness about visceral fat and the contribution and role that processed foods play in it. And uh, I think I think we're starting, you know, we're just starting to introduce it. And I'm super excited for you, Anthony, that you're, you're interested in it. So uh, another interesting phenomena is as you get rid of visceral fat and blood flow improves, it appears to provide better blood flow to the follicles and in particular, stem cells around follicles get better nutrients and they come back to life and you increase hair growth. So whether this happens to top of the head, I don't know, uh, but on the legs, it was easier to follow uh, because you can see the image um, on my leg on the left uh, shows tremendous hair growth on my leg on the right uh, as that visceral fat left. And in, in these photographs, you can see, uh, I, I really haven't lost hair, uh, uh, you, if you, you go to a Mall of America or shopping mall or church or something, most guys in their 60s uh, have thinning hair. But I've been spared because, you know, at age 48, when my hair, I think, was starting to thin, um, I just got rid of my visceral fat and it preserved my hair. And it, I've got new hair growth on my leg. So I'm going to guess I probably have some hair growth on my, on my scalp. I talked to a hair transplant surgeon, MD, and you can get an instrument called a disometer if anybody wants to buy me one. They're about $4,000. Uh, I don't got that kind of money <laughs> to buy a, a hair measuring instrument called a disometer. Uh, so I don't have nice, cool photographs and numbers to tell you about hair growth on the scalp. But uh, if you're somebody here that is thinning your hair, what the heck do you have to lose uh, but your visceral fat uh, if you want to try to preserve your hair? Uh, so I would be cutting out for sure processed foods, uh, eczema, uh, my leg there, terrible eczema and fat, gross leg there, uh, and now much leaner, healthier leg. Uh, and then this image here um, is shows uh, telangiectasias. So the last slide here, I'll cover and we can chat a little bit. These telangiectasias are known by your audience, probably by the term spider veins. So spider veins, um, 
are the nemesis of, of a lot of women, uh, soccer moms of America hate uh, spotter veins all over their, their thighs and uh, they go to vein clinics all across uh, the country in America to get them injected with hypertonic saline or get them stripped, surgically removed. And all you uh, have to do is start living appropriately healthy, go on the carnivore diet, uh, do the strategies I pinned, um, you know, cold showers, saunas, uh, sunshine, um, and uh, uh, you you will eliminate these spider veins that you can see, interestingly, oftentimes in thin skin. So the, the eyelids is a nice source uh, to look at them, the inside uh, medial aspect of your ankles, the inside aspect of your ankles, uh, you can see spider veins often. And uh, uh, women get them on their thighs. And for a gentleman listening, you get them on your foreskin. And uh, they, they are gross uh, anywhere in the body. They show disease. And they all reverse if you start living appropriately and healthy. And uh, I think it's uh, in large part as that visceral fat is eliminated, you get less fatty infiltration of skeletal muscle. But your arteries, your veins, and your capillaries, the largest part of them are, is actually the muscle of the vasculature. So capillaries, arteries, and veins, arterioles, and venules, they all have smooth muscle. And... The smooth muscle, again, um, I, will, I will say uh, we need to do studies to take a look at this. It's my opinion that smooth muscle is vulnerable to fatty infiltration just like uh, skeletal muscle is and in proportion to visceral fat. So as you eliminate that visceral fat, I think that's what is, uh, is responsible biochemically um, uh, to the uh, changes that we see in, in uh, vasculature. Uh, with uh, resolution of uh, spider veins uh, uh, being eliminated and the advent and onset of visible pulses and arteries uh, all over the body as, as uh, the, the fatty infiltrates are removed from the musculature of those, those arteries, they now behave better. So anyway, I think that's a pretty good point to stop right there. Um, and I think we did a better job of showing these images this time to your audience. And hopefully your audience will agree that, uh, that they could see this time better. And uh, 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 I, I hope if, uh, if we share this, we can we can do another live and answer questions maybe of people as they, they have, uh, have them too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess we can try and uh, unshare your screen and then. Uh, yeah, yep. yeah. Perfect. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for that. That was excellent. Um, and so for people that didn't see last time and didn't glean off the, uh, the, the slideshow, what would be your main tips for getting rid of visceral fat and improving health? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the first and foremost is to eliminate processed food. So starting there and, uh, you know, I, I really do advocate completely eliminating. There's certain people that could play around with a little bit, uh, but the more you eat, the more trouble you're going to get. And there are some people probably through the realm of the microbiome that they eat just a little bit. And uh, it's the, uh, uh, the inch, all the introduction they need to start circling the drain. They just spiral out of control. And sometimes a single nibble on a candy bar, uh, they descend into a darkness, some people, that they never recover from. And that's it. They just are on a binge for the rest of their life and th that they're gone. So um, I advocate just completely eliminating it. I don't miss those things. My quality of life is outstanding, uh, not having a bit of processed foods. And I'm happy to say, uh, as far as I'm aware, that I, I'm the only person I know of that has never had ever cheated one time since I purposed to do this in 13 years. Are you that way too? Oh yeah, I've, I've never cheated, ever, no. Dude, yeah. I need no to interest. hug you. Yeah. <laughs> you and I knew I really liked yeah. you. Dude, dad, yeah. I love that about you. So um, that's awesome. So now forever, I'm going to be ans uh, 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 acknowledging you, Anthony, yeah. that claim. I'm not gonna make that claim, wow. That's so exciting that on this podcast, we discovered that. So, um, yeah, so that's my first strategy is eliminating uh, processed foods. Uh, the second thing is um, 
uh, eating the carnivore diet, eating a, a meat-based diet, um, I, I think that um, the plants do have a prob problematic role in our digestive process. And uh, I do eat some plants. I, I eat it and, and advocate my clients to do so uh, only uh, when they're fermented to eliminate uh, the threats and by studies. Um, and they're variable um, how much uh, of these plant toxins are eliminated. But the longer the degree of fermentation, the more affected the fermentation, the less uh, contribution you you um, you see of these uh, lectins and saponins and phthalates and oxalates and the problems that we see with these plants. So uh, some fermented foods, and I, they probably should be thought of as not as as foods as much as thinking of them as um, really just uh, garnishes, and that, that you're only eating them for. Uh, microbial benefits. So um, I, I advocate eating meat with some microbes and chewing them together so that they're mixed together uh, so that you're mixing in beneficial microbes as you're chewing that meat instead of chewing in and mixing in pathogenic microbes that you might have in your mouth and your teeth and your gums. You and I know as physicians uh, that human bites are severely pathogenic Oftentimes the fight bite, you know, person that thinks he's victorious and knocking that guy's teeth out, the other guy's teeth out. It's the guy, the guy that gets the fight bite just in the operating room because he's got the, the rip roaring infection in his hand, you know, from that path pathogenic microbes from the, the quote loser in the fight. <laughs> so uh, I, I advocate, uh, you know, eating some, you know, fermented foods to include uh, for the purists within the uh, carnivore community. Um, maybe animal-based fermented foods such as kefir, yogurt, uh, sour cream, um, and uh, fermented raw milk cheese, like blue cheese and old world cheeses. Definitely not American craft signals, okay? That's not fermented cheese. That's processed like crap. Uh, so you want to get real old world cheese. Um, the third point I would uh, get into besides uh, eating I advocate fasting. I think fasting is a very interesting uh, process of uh, inducing beneficial autophagy to help uh, produce chaperone protein. So for those listening today, Google extended fasting, comma, autophagy, comma, chaperone proteins, comma, heat shock proteins, comma, cold shock proteins, and read about the realm of uh, improved protein synthesis as you, you fast. So I recommend fasting and and then uh, I I recommend uh, exercise exercising only in a fasted state. That's the only time I recommend my clients exercise is when they're fasting, when they're feeding. The, the mission is feeding and uh, reproduction. So you, you just eat uh, and you you you, uh, you you don't exercise. You you can you you, you can re re reproduce. Uh, uh, sexual relations, but you know, no, no exercise, uh, and I don't even fast when I exercise. All my blood flow is going to my gut. I'm not diverting, dividing missions to, uh, to to go to my uh, uh, gastro uh, gastro uh, to my muscles. All that blood is going to my gut. And then similarly, when I am fasting, there's no blood diverting to my gut. It's all available for performance in my muscles. So it's a different way of looking at it, but when you're a health and performance optimizing physician researcher like I am, I, I study every nook and cranny to, to try to extract the, the most amount of improvement. And so I and my clients now get their personal best records uh, when they're fasting, not in a fed state. So it's a feast fasting model where we do a huge amount of, uh, of uh, feasting, and then a, an extended amount of fasting. And I think that mimics more ancestrally how I lived. Um, and then when it comes to exercise, it's maximum intensity exercise. So we looked at in the National Science Foundation study uh, the absence of chronic disease in animals. And we noted that they um, first eat very clean. They're not eating processed foods and they're not, um, uh, they're not exercising like us going to a gym for uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And there are guys that go in there and women that go in there for hours. Um, they, we, you know, the animals just don't exercise that way. They exercise in a life and death manner. 
uh, maximally for a short period of time in some life and death struggle or some challenge for dominance. And uh, it's, it's all out and it's very brief. So that's how I advocate uh, exercising. Good examples of that are sprinting um, and then doing push-ups and pull-ups uh, to exhaustion, weightlifting uh, to, uh, to exhaustion and, and, uh, and failure, and, uh, and uh, condensing your workouts into a much, uh, much more intense and shorter uh, period of exercise. So I have averaged my exercise um, uh, to, to achieve the body that I have at the age of 60 um, the past 13 years. I've averaged only about, uh, uh, I would say, seven to 10 minutes every three days. Not much exercise. And that might seem shocking to many in the audience. But, you know, if you look at the equivalent in the animal kingdom, I, I just don't see animals exercising a lot. They exercise like real badasses super hard mm -hmm. uh, in a very period of time and frequently. So uh, that's what I have my clients do. And we're, and we're we're getting, you know, in my opinion, the best results I've ever seen anywhere um, doing these these strategies. And we're we're also showing it's not just the outside. We're doing it by MRI to help track this. So um, exercise is a keen strategy. And then another one is sunshine. I think there's a lot of importance to sunshine. And I have the benefit, having gotten um, uh, visible pulses, of seeing, Anthony, when I go out in the sunshine and ignore our dermatology counterparts, no, I'm not putting sunscreen on. No, I'm not avoiding that which I think we're biologically adapted through, you know, four million years of uh, evolution uh, to be able to, to be tolerant uh, of uh, sunshine. I go out in the sunshine and immediately my endothelial cells uh, start producing nitric oxide. And I know that because I can visibly see immediately my magnitudes of my pulses increase. Uh, so not to be crude, but it's almost almost like you give the example. It's like an immediate erection. I don't get an erection, but you know the the uh, prominence of uh, of uh, erection within a human body uh, is the mechanism of nitric oxide. Well, uh, almost equal to and uh, the the equivalent of significance to to nitric oxide when I go out in the sunshine is these pulses become huge. So I, it's like my dashboard, okay? So when you're driving a car, you glance down your dashboard. I look at my, my visible arterial pulses to help guide me in affirming that what I'm doing is good. So I go out in the sunshine, I see visible pulses. Uh, I know that sunshine is good. I go into my sauna, I do a sauna, and I see my visible pulses, the magnitude increase from a sauna. I know it's good. Uh, I, I do fasting and I see the magnitude of my visible pulses are enhanced because uh, nitric oxide is associated with sunshine, saunas, uh, fasting. And then when I sprint, my uh, magnitudes of my visible pulses are significantly improved. And I'm not talking heart rate. Don't confuse uh, the pulse, meaning your pulse, which are your heart, how many times beats per minute. I'm talking how significant is that flow of blood, this big, enormous <clears throat> of blood flow that you can see. I call it the amplitude or magnitude of that wave coursing through um, becomes, gives me that visible uh, affirmation that that is muy bueno. Sunshine, saunas, uh, fasting, maximum intensity exercise. And the other visible, you know, dashboard is the, the post-workout muscle pump. So, you know, looking for that when you work out, uh, take your photographs. And if you're listening to that, I'm throwing out a challenge. If you got some significant post-workout muscle uh, pump photographs, uh, DM me, send them to me. I might use them in, in some of my uh, future podcasts and YouTube videos and, and production material. Um, and I'd like to talk to you because I'd like to see why you have particularly... Um, I, I got plenty of examples of 20 year olds, so you don't have to do that. I got teenagers who live at home. But if you're somebody in your your fifties uh, and sixties and seventies and you're achieving a significant post uh, uh, um, workout muscle pump, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like you to share your photographs. So uh, those those are my uh, significant things. Oh, one last one is oxytocin. 
Uh, oxytocin is a great one. You get oxytocin from being empathetic uh, with uh, uh, with humans and uh, dogs. Interestingly, if you just have empathy, your pet, you even think about petting your dog, oxytocin gets released. Um, and then, you know, you we, we are social creatures. So we're meant, uh, if you are living alone by yourself and you're listening to this and you don't have friends, get some friends, go get some meaningful, jo join, you know, uh, uh, a health community or something. Uh, get involved in other people so you can start having empathy with other people. We are not lone wolves. We are not meant to be uh, by ourselves. We are pack creatures, tribal, clannish. And so oxytocin is, is a really important one. And uh, I mentioned the microbiome early on. I think optimizing the microbiome is hugely important. So um, I think cutting out chlorine and uh, judicious, very careful use of uh, antibiotics, unless they're really uh, needed, I would I would not be taking antibiotics because of their destructive influence in the microbiome, and then positive influences by eating uh, fermented foods that, that we mentioned uh, before, and then hanging out with healthy people like Anthony, you know, <laughs> Doctor Chafee. He, you know, dude's never cheated. He's going to have some super powerful uh, microbes on his body and in his body, and he's somebody you. You, you know, you, you, you want to be hanging with that dude. He's, I would be harvesting microbes from, from <laughs> Anthony. I five that guy all the time. You know, so, uh, you know that's, uh, those are my, uh, my list of recommendations. Perfect. So as far as, as far as fasting concern is concerned, maybe a couple of questions. Is this, um, do you find that there's a, there's a benefit on top of, a carnivore diet or even like a ketogenic diet. I know there've been studies with so-called fasting mimicking diets, which are just a ketogenic diet. Or is it, do you find that there's a benefit on top of a carnivore diet with fasting? And then how, how long would you recommend people fast for in that context? Yeah. So really good question. So uh, I have to say one of the most uh, significant changes I've seen in in my capability is within an interesting test called a, a one-legged uh, stance. So for the audience sake, I, I encourage you to do this and record it, do a video uh, memorialization of where you are. It's another biomarker, I think, far exceeding your, uh, your cholesterol panels and lipids that your doctor is pushing. In fact, you should say, doctor, I'll do your cholesterol panel if you do the one-legged stance with me. So. Have your, you stand up on one leg, you have to close your eyes and you see now how long you stand. I no longer say that. In the studies, it was how long you stand. People stand and they're wobbling over like crazy. It's how well you stand, how good you do that. So if you stand real on one leg with your eyes closed on one foot, with your eyes closed really still, you're really healthy. Who does that? Who's really healthy? Kids. 10-year-olds to 14-year-olds without a lot of influence yet of visceral fat degrading their central and peripheral nervous system, which allows them to um, make a minute adjustments to keep themselves nice and still. Kids stand like trees. And uh, I practice doing that stand every day for 90 seconds in my kitchen for two years. Uh, when you're a, a, you know, a performance-optimized physician, you do crazy things. I tracked that every day for two years. <laughs> I had all this data, sheets and sheets of data on that. It never got better. Uh, but when I started doing extended fasting, Anthony, oh my God, I uh, it was like night and day. I, I went um, four years without doing that test or three years. And then I did that um, one-legged stand after I started fasting three days, 72 hours straight um every week and that test enormously improved so to answer your question i do believe that fasting adds on um, more than just carnivore alone i've never seen it studied in isolation one-to-one -one. i'd love to see that it's a brilliant question so well uh, how much different would uh ex extended fasting be relative to carnivore as interventions um I'm just cautious and have my clients do both. Uh, but uh, I have had some clients because I work for my clients. I'm just a consultant. They're the boss of their body. I call them the CEO of their, their corporation. 
So they can reject me. I'm just the lowly consultant working for them. And so some of my clients have said, oh, I just can't do fasting. They're not, they're not the ones that are moving head the most. They don't get as good a beneficial results. So when, when clients come to work with me, I put them in a client group. So they have an online community. They get to talk to each other. And so the ones boasting about you know, fasting get those benefits. And the other ones say, I can't do that. I'm not there. And, and they're kind of quiet. But guess what happens? They start fasting. <laughs> they see everybody else getting better in this community of my, my clients. So um, I would like to see that study. I'd like to mm. see you know, how carnivore, what sort of a additional contribution uh, extended fasting has over carnivore. That's a brilliant question. Well, I mean, and, and it might even be able to do it with, with some of your own clients you know and see you know and sort of differentiate them get get some in a carnivore group and and carnivore fasting group and and see the differences and try to try to uh see if you can find some objective measures and differences between their their progress i think that'd be very interesting i think it would be very interesting you know you talk about all the chaperone proteins and the uh the different different um you know, epigenetic effects that we have noticed from extensive fasting, certainly after 72 hours, uh, you know, that seem to show up. I think there have been studies with you know, fasting mimicking diets showing that you have similar sort of outputs, but I, I don't, I've never, I don't know if there are any studies that, you know, that really show, you know, like a difference in like a long-term fast versus long-term ketosis or, uh, and those sort of epigenetic effects as well. So I think it was, it's, it's something that's always really interested me and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and I think that would be yeah fascinating area to study. Well, if there's somebody that out there in your audience that would be willing to do that, I would love to, you know, have them step forward and, uh, mm -hmm. they will come in and, and, uh, become a client of mine. I will help them. Uh, with these, uh, you know, super powerful MRI scans and allow them to track uh, the, the changes they get with carnivore for a period of time and then introduction of fasting um, on top of that to track the, the additional change that they they may get uh, or not get uh, with, with the addition of, uh, of fasting. I'm happy to, ta to take a look at. I do know, though, uh, we, we looked at fasting and extended fasting during the National Science Foundation uh, with a, a static diet without changing. And that intervention alone dramatically mm -hmm. used uh, visceral fat. I mean, in a very, very short period of time, um, faster than just uh, carnivore alone. Now, mm -hmm. I will say about carnivore, because I advocate it, uh, no other way of eating uh, eliminates visceral fat and creates a more optimal um, you know, fat to muscle ratio than the carnivore diet. So we looked at vegans, vegetarians, pescatarians, um, uh, omnivores, standard American diet. We have a lot of standard American diet. They go nowhere, but, you know, more visceral fat. <laughs> um, and the best ones were, were, were the carnivore diets. And I, you know, I had a poor physician who was a vegan, um, who came to me, uh, and I said, you know, I said, okay, he was a doctor. And I said, doctor, I won't say his name. I'll just say, I'll make up a name. Dr. Walter, we're going to quantify the amount of visceral fat you have. The MRI scan will be able to, because at that time I used software. I don't use a software system anymore to, to do a numeric representation or quantification of visceral fat because numbers don't work. But at that time, I told him, we're going to quantify how much visceral fat you have by MRI um, and uh, once, once, once your scan is done. And he goes... He was an older guy. Oh, are you? I should have known by his voice. Oh, well, you're not going to find any visceral fat in me. I have been vegan for 37 years. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and this guy, he had pounds, yeah, pounds of visceral fat inside of him. And he was a tofu. He's this little skinny older guy. And mm. what did he do? He went out and started eating meat. He he nice. went at, at, at this was before the the carnivore diet, but he just started eating meat. And we rescanned him, and guess what? He he lost a substantial portion of his visceral fat in that intervening time. So, um, you know, on that point, voices, you know, I have lots of people. I have, I have more people contacting me than I can take on as clients. And that's why I'm working with seven other doctors. I'm glad I'm getting you in this. I need to train more people about these visceral fat and MRI scans because there's a huge demand out there. I can't meet it all. 
But, you know, I talk to people all day long and I can hear visceral fat in their voices. So mm -hmm. I think it's responsible for the aging voice, but you also hear it in the younger voice. So um, you may hear it in somebody who's 30 years old who starts, um, who's heavy. And um, my kids used to walk around saying this when they're younger. Ha, my name is Chubby. Uh, my mama's chubby, my daddy's chubby, and I'm chubby, you know, and it's this <laughs> burdened tongue, uh, burdened with fat. So the tongue is a muscle. It's part of the skeletal muscle system. And it becomes burdened with myosteatosis, fatty infiltrates as well, and it becomes uh, impaired, and um, you you lose the, the functionality and the, and the resonance, the ideal optimal state of the tongue is compromised. And so to the laryngeal mus muscles as well. So um, if uh, I'm interested in working with a, um, a famous singer, because I, I don't want just any singer, but I'd like a famous singer. Uh, if, if you know anybody and you're listening and your, your friend is, your friends with a famous singer, have them come my way and I want to scan their tongues and their throats and their bellies and their heart and their brains and uh, get them to become optimally healthy so that we get to enjoy their voices for longer. Because mm. I'm very sad that I grew up with Elton John and now he is, his voice is, is very burdened sounding. I prefer to listen to an Elton John who's 80 years old, still singing like he's 20. Uh, but that's, that's where my mind goes in a health and performance optimized position is how can we preserve the treasures of the world that are resident within humans? and get them to be optimally healthy by helping them to be aware of what truly matters, getting rid of visceral fat and the, the rapid progression, unrecognized, untreated, unaddressed chronic disease that's going on. Um, it's the biggest problem in the world. Uh, doctors completely ignore it, except to the extent that they can uh, exploit it and profit from it. So it's allowed to exist, in my opinion, by a system uh, that simply uses it to, to, uh, to develop remuneration and make money from it. And it's a crime against humanity. And I, as a former criminal prosecutor, would say I would be interested in being a part of a tribunal that prosecutes the people that are responsible, that have been identified. If we can figure out through RICO and organized crime that this system is set up to uh, create financial profits in the same way Ford was held um, in the 1970s to be uh, liable and responsible for the poor design of the Pino that resulted in deaths of humans. I think that's exactly what's going on. And um, I'm appalled of the tolerance that the system has for putting up with the, the largest part of our economy that delivers the absolute worst production of service to consumers in the form of just pills that mm -hmm. allows people to fall apart if you were buying anything else that fell apart as fast as human bodies do, it would never be any kind of a, a successful system, much less at the top. But that's where we are in humanity. I'm sorry if I sound mad, but I am, because we're talking about not only quality lives, but lives. People, mm -hmm. the, the, the chronic disease is killing people. It's degrading us. And we have never seen the amount of disease that exists today in our species that we right now that we're seeing uh, at any point of humanity. And it's really uh, a confluence of processed foods and um, all the nonsense out there and the the abandon, wholesale abandonment to humanity <clears throat> that our profession has done, no longer putting the best outcome of the patient first. It's always Guy says the patient first, but it's really finances and profit that's first and uh, I want to create an electronic medical record. And if you're listening today, every electronic medical record that has ever been designed is, is designed to optimize profits, not designed to optimize the human being. And in the future, I'd like to see an electronic medical record that includes all the biomarkers that I talked about and many more than many other better, more intelligent physicians are going to come forward and scientists and health coaches whoever will identify markers that we should be paying attention to that truly optimize human beings. And that's what should be in these electronic medical records. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it would be amazing if, if uh, we could uncover something like that. I do remember there was a leaked video from some investment group where they were having a 
slide share presentation. And one of the slides said, is it you know, good economic is a good financial model or investment model to cure diseases. And the, you know, the premise was, you know, should we, should we actually fix these things and, and actually get people healthy or should we perpetuate disease and, and just prolong the suffering and, and put them into a chronic state where we have a, a customer for life sort of thing. And I think that's one of the most immoral and unethical and evil things that has ever been uh, contemplated. You know, just perpetuating human suffering and illness for profit. I think that is just absolutely disgusting uh, sort of mentality. Well, I, I, I'm not surprised. I'd like to see that video if you sent to me. I'm, I don't know that yeah. I could watch it because I, 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 I might go scorched earth if I see it. <laughs> but uh, I know that uh, that kind of mentality exists in there. I have a, somebody that I followed on Twitter. I was his second follower. He's a PhD and he, was, he came out. He's a carbo if I could say this right, carbohydrologist, car he studied he studied carbohydrates for big pharma. And he recounts a, a, a trip on an airplane in a corporate jet with a, the, a few of the sea levels. And he's their darling carbohydrate scientist, their little puppet, right? <laughs> to help them maximize profits. And uh, the, one of the sea levels said to him, our favorite drugs that we have are drugs they create, uh, they create side effects that we have other drugs to help cure and help treat. Yeah. And it's a lot of insanity that yeah. operates with, you know, big pharma uh, used to. And, you know, listen, I, I'm not myopic. I, I'm not, you know, complete one-sided. I know that there are some benefits to drugs, but listen, uh, we can no longer pretend about the, the greed and the obfuscation and uh, departure from the the singular most important uh, focus that we should be having, which is the the optimization of health of patients, um, and it's it's unfortunately been sidetracked by the pursuit of uh, money. And what I want to try to do in my startup is to to make money by really truly optimizing people. And you know, if you're listening today, you know, put your money where that's going on. Okay, where where people are truly being optimized. So mm -hmm. I get startup going. I, we don't even have a name for it yet. We're still struggling. So if you got clever names, come forward and DM me. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what we want to do. We want to try to figure out ways that physicians and and if I can't get enough physicians, Anthony, to understand these biomarkers and visceral fat, um, you know, uh, like you are now, uh, I, I'm going to go with health coaches and some, and per, personal trainers or come up with a whole new different thing because you know the truth is i'd like to see the board of medicine try to prosecute a health coach for reading visceral fat and mri because the first thing i would ask you bring one physician witness to testify that that's what they do in your state right now yeah it, it's not being done so if the doctors aren't going to improve people we need somebody else so um uh, yeah it's just a uh, an appalling situation, and I'm, I'm going to get I'm going to give the physicians a try. I'm I'm out there in social media. I'm you know screaming top of my lungs about visceral fat and following appropriate biomarkers. And mm -hmm. uh, most people are just quietly sitting in the background, you know, eating popcorn, watching you know the the whole thing. And uh, and and then I've got you know about seven or eight physicians that are now come forward and interested in doing visceral fat. Super excited about you and, and Max down there in Australia. Um, it sounds like Max Gohane, Dr. Gohane, is going to be uh, doing a, a, a practice and has a radiology practice on board. They're going to be uh, reading visceral fat and offering. So if you are in Australia and you're listening, um, get with uh, Dr. Gohane and, and Dr. Chaffee and and uh, learn about visceral fat, get your, get your success and and join the ranks of, uh, of humans that are truly optimizing instead of humans that are just getting treated. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's the main thing too. I really like that ethos as a, as a doctor of actually trying to get people better and actually be healthy and not need our services. You know, I mean, I think that's, that's what we're supposed to do. We're, we're supposed to be getting people to the point that they don't need us. And, you know, as opposed to like this model of, of, of creating a, a forever patient, I don't, I don't think that that's the right thing to do. And I, uh, I believe strongly that if we're doing our job correctly, we won't have to see people all the time. We'll need to see new people and, and be there to help people when they need help.
And that's the whole idea. You know, they shouldn't need help throughout their entire life. They shouldn't need chronic, you know, they shouldn't have chronic debilitating issues that never go away. Hopefully, you know, I mean, there are, there are, you know, cases that do exist, of course, uh, where there's no sort of getting around that, but, you know, for the vast majority of people, you should be able to get people healthy so that you only need that. And you only need to see a doctor when there's an accident and emergency or something like that. And that's yeah, no, what we can get back to. Complete, complete agree. So I think, uh, uh, surgeons and ER doctors will have, uh, have good jobs and, and the, uh, uh, yeah, you just, you won't need as many doctors. Uh, I think a big problem to you on today is that health insurance is is all set up to propagate disease and and the problem with it is um uh health insurance they make their chief revenue uh by the cost of uh health insurance uh in the form of monthly premiums that the insured pays you know so if um if the prevalence of disease was really low uh, you, they wouldn't be able to charge much money for their insurance because it's just not that big of a threat. But uh, boy, when everybody's dropping dead of heart attacks and strokes and cancer and they're morbidly obese and they've got diabetes and God, they got pumps and things hanging off their body, uh, they just look awful. I mean, that just drives um, the marketability of health insurance. So I think the, one of the least, the last places you're going to see an appetite for getting people healthy is going to be in the insurance mm -hmm. realm. And wow. uh, an example of that is automobile insurance was approached by Google. I heard this very interesting Google exec uh, who was part of their moonshot stuff and figuring out really cool stuff. And so he was involved in driverless operating systems. And the very first operating system that Google developed for driverless cars uh, looked at uh, a 250 feet of uh, uh, direction 360 degrees every way everywhere uh 360 degrees uh 60 times a second so mm -hmm. the, the functionality that was so far superior to a human being they could tell in the very first system they developed that they could prognosticate in the future it will be illegal for a human to set their hands on controls because machines will do it safer and they were able to reason that in the future, we will, within our lifetime, probably in the next 10 years, I think, I, at least I heard, we will have a year in which not a single American is killed by a car because of driverless operating systems will come in. So the effect commercially, economically, uh, within the automobile industry of that is enormous. So what that means is automobile insurance uh, will go down to probably about 50 bucks a year because it's going to be so extraordinarily safe, uh, the necessity to assure it against an event like that is so unlikely, and the damage factors are so small that it will reduce it. Well, just apply that to humanity and understand why health insurance, um, you know, they'll pay all day long to have your cholesterol checked, because guess what? Uh, if anything, uh, the lower you get your cholesterol, the more likely you're going to be diseased and die. And so they're all behind that one. But you watch crickets when visceral fat comes up. Mm. They will not support that because once they look at it and they see just how much associated. And if you're listening today and you're struggling with any medical problems, okay, I forgot to mention this. I like to say this now. You have any condition at all and you hate it, I want you to jump on Google right now. And I want you to put that, that medical condition down, comma, visceral fat. And you'll find a study that shows that condition is worsened by visceral fat. And then you'll be like, damn, how come I never heard about that? Well, get back to all the points that we keep making here. The healthcare system doesn't really want you better. They wanna make money off you. So they're making a money, a lot of money off the problem that's vexing you that you can't get any solutions for. You just keep getting more pills and whatever. It's just not working. But if you understand now the role of visceral fat has in that condition, you eliminate it, you'll see it go away. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's hopefully what, what people will be able to do. And then we'll, you know, be able to, to, to sink the sort of the system from, from below and knock out some of the pillars, you know, beneath it, if they won't go, you know, we just have to make them go. We just have to make this, this message go wide enough so that people can take charge of their own health and get free of that that whole uh, just disease yeah. cycle and uh, and then 
you know, they'll have to make some, some adjustments and changes, you know, something that I was, I was, uh, you know, talking to others about that, you know, you have to find a, you have to find a, a positive economic model that getting people healthy will, will, will profit people, you know, because if there's that profit model, then people will get behind it. And they'll, that's when these sorts of, you know, movements and just industrial size movements will start going, you know, especially with, you know, uh, professor Seafried talking about, you know, cancer, as soon as we can figure out how to make you know ketogenic diet profitable for people treating cancer, then, then we can do this. But, it, you know, it's very difficult at the moment to think of what that could be. But one of the, one of the solutions that people have come up with is going to businesses, you know, the, the, business themselves as opposed to the the insurance company and saying hey you know i can save you millions of dollars a year on your insurance premiums that you have to pay these insurance companies by getting your people healthy and by by you know you come to me we'll get your people actually healthy actually healthy and your insurance premiums will will go down to nothing um nike would do that back in the 90s they they had programs with their employees where if you cycled to work you'd get uh, an extra two hundred dollars a week. And this is in the nineties, you know. So that was actually that was actually some money, you know, <laughs> as opposed to you know, that's you know, coffee at Starbucks now. But um, and if you ran to work, you'd get an extra four hundred dollars a week. And if you exercise, if you went to the gym, there'd be, always be a gym in the, whatever facilities they had in their main facilities. If you went to the gym for lunch, you get a two hour lunch instead of a one hour lunch. You could work out for an hour for free on the company. And so it was just ways of that they would pay you to get more healthy. And, you know, that was worth it to them. $400 a week was worth it to them. And, and, and you know, losing an hour of work a day was worth it to them to get you healthy because it, it reduced their insurance by by so much and and improved productivity and uh reduced sick days and things like that so if you i think we can you know model that to to big businesses saying hey you come to us we will draw we'll save you you know with big companies tens of millions hundreds of millions of dollars in insurance premiums i think that is a potential uh, uh area for economic economic I, you know i, I you do it gives me a lot of hope that when we saw chronic disease leave in the human body, that human performance increased. That's how I, uh, I, I decided to become a specialist, a uh, physician specializing in health and human performance optimization is that I, I had no medical training, no experience with human performance uh, improving with the elimination of disease because, you know, by, frankly, our conventional medical profession is, it is does not anecdotally experience the elimination of disease. We treat it. So um, the fact that humans could perform better uh, through increased productivity gives me a lot of hope that it's going to be corporate America in the absence of the healthcare system, conventional healthcare or health insurance, um, stepping up and doing the right thing. Corporate America is going to profit from it. And uh, so the National Science Foundation has you know, as a mandate, you know, given a grant, they want you to come up with a commercially viable platform. So I think, you know, a for-profit entity that learns how to make money off improving people, like I said before, is an important point. And there are corporations that have kind of incentives and with various different degrees. I once had a patient walk into my practice and I was talking about visceral fat and health and all this stuff. And he told, he, I forget one, what company worked for, is either Pepsi or Coca-Cola, okay? It was a big company, uh, Fortune 100 company. And uh, he was, uh, he won the Corporate Health uh, uh, of the Year Award. He was the healthiest employee in the whole company by his cholesterol labs and, and <laughs> everything that Coke said was healthy. And do you know, one month after he won it, he had a heart attack. Oh, and so I, I'm yeah. like, this is surreal yeah. that this guy's in front of me telling me this story. One month I've been declared by Coca-Cola or Pepsi as the healthiest employee. He mm. has a heart attack. Well, go figure. So, oh. yeah, we got, um, I think, an important mission to, to leverage and try to educate corporate America uh, on that. And my startup is is targeting that. We're, we're very interested in that particular space. We want to work with uh, executives. If you're a C-level of a self-insured company and you listen to this and you think this is interesting, DM me because I'd like to optimize you and I'd like this to trickle down and uh, I'd like to uh, 
you know, bust it out in your company, increase productivity and profitability. And if you're that kind of a visionary C-level, or if you're a friend of a visionary C-level, uh, get this to uh, him or her. Uh, I, I'd love to make that pitch. And we, you know, like uh, Dr. Chafee said, I'd love to see corporate America uh, step up and deliver what the largest part of our economy, healthcare, has uh, subrogated and abandoned completely, um, which is the op true optimization of humans. And uh, we, as good as corporate America is um, in commerce, um, you know, corporate America could really improve it considerably. Or Australia, you know, uh, if you're wherever you're at, um, I'll work with any company with the right people because uh, I'm I'm about improving humans. Uh, I'm a diehard American, but um, I I want to improve humans. What works to improve Amer uh, humans in uh, in Hungary is going to improve humans in uh, in the United States or Australia. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I'm happy to be a part of that too. If anybody, any um, you know, venturous uh, CEOs out there that are that are interested in that, happy happy to talk about that. We all get all put our heads together because. You know, I think that's that's you have to get you have to get a viable economic model uh, to go forward on this. I mean, uh, otherwise, it's, it's really just the grassroots movement uh, because everything else is, is sort of pitted against us. And uh, I think that that's that is a really powerful thing, though. I think that there are millions of people around the world that are coming around to this and getting more and more interested in it. And and more and more people are are hearing about it and talking about it. And now as a name, you know, a carnivore diet and people are talking about it on on news programs even if to to vilify it and um and and say it's horrible but at least they have to talk about it at least it's getting out there and then people can actually look at that and say like okay well what is this these guys must be crazy and they listen to it and go hmm, actually that's it's not all that crazy it actually kind of make a bit of sense and so and maybe they try it and and maybe they take take an mri and go like oh god i did not realize i had so much visceral fat and maybe they try some of these interventions and and it goes away and they hmm look at that so well hopefully people people can get uh, inspired by that as well and um see some better changes i'm very optimistic in the next five years or so i think this is i think this is bordering on 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 a mainstream idea now because at least people are talking about it and they're talking about it more and more in, in more mainstream circles and i think that at a certain point it's going to hit a hit a critical mass and then people are going to at least try it you know a lot of people try veganism vegetarianism but there's a reason that there's only two percent of people are, are are vegan and that's because they try it and they do it for a couple months and they feel miserable and it does it doesn't help you know maybe if they're eating a whole bunch of processed food and garbage there's a there's a relative benefit and they feel better but there was there was some st statistic or something like 84 percent of people who go, uh, you know, vegan, uh, vegetarian, stop after the first year because generally because of health reasons, they don't they, they don't feel good, and so they have to stop for their health. So uh, this is the exact opposite. If people if people actually tried a carnivore diet within a month or two and they saw just how amazing they felt, I mean, I I never went back. I never planned to. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you, and uh, my clients are the same way. You know, it's it's interesting to me. Um, uh, as as real and significant as it is, there's just such a large segment of the population. Um, just yesterday, I was at a a, a party where it, you know a, a 63 year old guy with a big belly had never heard of the carnivore diet, and this this was after he had seen some film called Steak Revolution, and he his his favorite food in the world is steak, so he he traveled from you know, North America to Spain just to eat at the best steak restaurant yeah. <laughs> with these cows that are all grass fed and this golden mm -hmm. yellow fat, all the stuff that I, that I like and, and, you know, low marbling and things. And yet he, he never knew, knew anything about the carnivore diet. So he, he got an earful from me. Last yeah. night. <laughs> but I, I do like the changes that are happening as part of the discussion. And, uh, we see a increasing dialogue, um, about it. And I just hope if you're listening today and you're, you're benefiting from the carnivore diet that you, you, you use your own experience to encourage other people and help promote it because I do believe it's saving lives and I do believe it's improving um, the quality of living for so many people. And, uh, and so I, I'm super excited about the carnivore community. And, and uh, we are we are different because we are getting better results. 
And uh, I, I think we want to try to rise above the fray as much as possible for some of the din that happens where, you know, it gets, a, a, you know, a, a little unpleasant. Um, I think, you know, I think we have the merits and we have the results. And so we, we don't have to resort to some of the uh, um, emotional response that I see within the, the vegan community coming coming after us. You know, we can we can just show uh, we can show results and that point to the spurious studies and things. Um, in the in the long run, what really matters is the study that's an N of one. If you're mm -hmm. listening, that is the study that happens to you when you start eating um, an all meat diet. You'll find um, the the that is far more meaningful than what might happen some other obscure study that you don't even have enough skills to interpret. Probably <clears throat> whether it's good or bad, of which probably. You know, a hundred physicians looking at it would argue differently about the results anyhow to begin with. So, just uh, concentrate on your own life, improving it, see what happens. But you know, be rigidly scientific. Um, I I'm always a little cautious about you know people deciding things on their own based on their feelings, because um, you you might uh, end up succumbing or just really falling into heroin if you're really chasing chasing feelings or chasing carbohydrates <laughs> because. They do have that that kind of a feeling, but you got to look at you know what it comes down for me is health is how you look and how you perform. So the choices you make about the food, how you eat, when you eat, fasting, exercise, and uh, uh, sleep and and stress and things should all all be um, uh, predicated upon improving your appearance and perform improving your performance. So you know taking a look at at uh, making sure that you you're always getting better, improving, and uh, that, that's why I'm super excited about um, health and performance optimization, especially. I hope uh, I hope other physicians decide to do it and follow me and uh, pursuing it and uh, offer that to uh, to patients because I think uh, I think it's a very interesting and important, uh, especially in the future. Uh, I'm the only one doing it right now, uh, but you know, one day down the road, hopefully there'll be residency programs on it and. Uh, we get a lot of other uh, health optimizing physicians um, out there. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, Dr. Morrow, thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure uh, to speak to you again, as always. Uh, where can people uh, find you and find your work? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram, just uh, at my name, at dr, or Dr. D R S E A N O M A R A at Dr. Sean O'Meara, and the same with Twitter. And I also have a YouTube channel that you can see um, some videos. I'm pretty quirky. Uh, I spend I spend more time thinking about science than I do production value. So I don't have the, the level of uh, prowess and production's qualities that uh, Dr. The Plant Free MD does, but uh, you can find me on YouTube, Dr. Sean O'Meara uh, on YouTube. And I also have a website, that's just www.drseanomara.com, drshawnomara.com. So um, feel free to take a look. I have lots of free content out there to inspire you. And I'll make a pitch if you're somebody uh, that you uh, think um, I'd enjoy working with, that you, um, you're you unusually motivated. Uh, you're, I look for the alpha personality, somebody who wants to biologically optimize. And you got the financial resources to, you know, pay for MRIs and have the best approach to look what's going on. Uh, we will study the Hades out of you and optimize your muscle and fat and do everything we can uh, to make you the very best biological version of yourself possible. And I, I love super motivated people like that. I'm attracting the best clients in the world. I think there's more out there. And uh, I could use some more seed levels because I want to take this to corporate America. So Again, you know, if you're at sea level, corporate America or corporate Australia, uh, get a hold of me and uh, I'll, I'll hook you up with Dr. Chafee down there in Australia and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bust this out and make it happen. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, I'll put all of that in the in the show notes as well and link this back to our previous discussion as well, where we talk uh, about similar, similar uh, topics and more. Uh, Dr. Mara, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chaffee. Take care. Yeah.
Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys.